Hello, and thanks for joining us today. I'm really glad you could be here. Today, we're talking about something we've never really discussed before at all, which is immigration. And it sounds kind of like a crazy topic to have here on the Business Credit Finance Show, but there's a lot of things too. There's a lot of things that a lot of us in the United States don't even know is possible with getting passports, even getting a second passport, and a lot of other things from business that we can do in Canada, traveling to Canada, uh, as well as many other things that immigration does to help us now and creative ways that we can use this to be able to grow our businesses. So for more than a decade, Brandon Miller has actually been involved in immigration and settlement of newcomers to Canada. And he's operated a boutique immigration practice, Maple Immigration Services in Toronto, uh, where he has helped countless people find their way to Canadian shores and settle in successfully into their new home. Now, Brandon approaches immigration differently by taking a holistic approach to immigration and settlement as well. The very unique approach led to the Immigration Success System, which is trademarked, and a published book, Second Passport, that outlines the system and introduces the idea and benefits of a second passport in Canada. Brandon is a proud Canadian who sees himself as a nation builder responsible for shaping the Canada of tomorrow and with its true asset, the people who call Canada their home. Now, he's a certified immigration consultant, is a passionate about everything immigration, and enjoys not only helping people to come to Canada, but also seeing that they get integrated into the country as well. Brandon, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, it's funny because as we were going into the pre-interview and I looked at your website, Second Passport, I gotta be honest with you, man. I don't even, didn't even know it was possible to get a second passport, even nor know what a second passport is. So be, but with my ignorance, let's lead there because I think a lot of other people might be in the same place I am. What is a second passport? I didn't even know that something like this was possible. You know what? That's actually a really common misconception. Um, and I find mostly within like the Western world. So when you start talking about specifically like, you know, Americans, people from Europe and different places like that, they don't really think about a second passport as something that's, you know, kind of a, a tool that can be used. Um, when I deal with a lot of clients from different areas of the world, such as, you know, China, for instance, or, or Vietnam or different places like that, mostly Asian countries, they look at it as a passport as a tool that's used for certain things like facilitating travel, facilitating different business, uh, even as a backup in some cases that, you know, where I can have a place to go and kind of settle. So again, this is something that's starting to come uh, very much more relevant within the Western world. I, I think we've had a lot of inquiries from the American side where people are exploring that. And there's so many great benefits in terms of uh, just having that option, not only for yourself, but your kids, grandkids, and all of the different things like that. And certainly, um, as an American, for instance, you can carry two passports seamlessly and actually capitalize on the benefits on both sides of the border. So first of all, w w let's still look at a passport and look at how a second passport works. So is it, well, I, get, I have so many questions. So yeah. first of all, a passport primarily from my experience is used, you know, I use my passport to be able to travel to other countries, right? A lot mm -hmm. of people just recognize that that's what's needed to go to other countries. So what's the purpose of a second passport? Is it something I can get coming from another country? Like, because the United States isn't going to issue me two passports, right? I have right. to get one from the United States and one from somewhere else. Right. So a second passport in a different country. So what it should be is a second citizenship, right? Um, so you can't get a passport in a country unless you have a, uh, the citizenship in the country. So really what you're getting is, is you have American citizenship and Canadian citizenship. Um, so that's basically what it is. A, a passport is just simply a travel document, as document. you alluded to. Yeah, so I, it, it should actually be second citizenship, but I guess, you know, citizenship. I, I love it. Makes sense. Right. So that yeah. being said, what, 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 what uh, can you get citizenship in more than two countries or more? Oh, than, yeah. How many countries can you have citizenship in? Uh, you can have citizenship. The most I've ever dealt with is I've, I've had a client that's had uh, four and they were working on their fifth. Uh, citizenship. So a lot of people can get citizenship through descent. Uh, they can get it through the naturalization process where they move into a different country uh, or, you know, basically being born in a place. Um, yeah. Or through their parents, through their lineage there. Yeah. And one of my friends is doing this in Italy. And it's kind of a nightmare because yeah. like her grandma came over and her name was, wasn't even the real name that she's now used. Yeah. And, <laughs> I, and like she's got to go back and track all this yeah. stuff in order to do it. But what I would imagine once she's done that, that that would be able to be used in a lot of other countries to be able to do it. But how do you get third or fourth? Because you can't, your lineage can't be from like everywhere. But when I look at mine, I guess I'm from Germany, I'm from Europe. Like there's several countries that if I look at my DNA, yeah. right? But how does that work? 
So for instance, I'll just use the example of the person that I was speaking about. So uh, his parents were from a European country and his, his dad was from a European country and his mom was from Australia. Um, and then actually they had moved to a third country where they were staying and then they've moved to Canada. Right. And then he married somebody else from another country. If that okay. makes sense. That so makes sense. It, he's, so he's got the ability to get citizenship through marriage. He's got the lineage from two parents from different countries, and then he's immigrated to another country and, and a third country that they were in. So there are people that um, a lot of different expat families and whatnot that will move around the world quite quite frequently, um, and they you know if the if the child's born in a particular country, then you know depending on the rules of that country, they can actually get citizenship. Now, is that the only thing you could do to become a citizen? You have to have some kind of lineage to that country, or like I, I don't have any lineage in Canada. Can I go to Canada and just absolutely, a yeah? So Canada right now, we're we're uh, we're welcoming record numbers to the country. Over the next three years, we're bringing in 1.2 million people. Um, and what a lot of people, a lot of people, when they you start talking about immigration, they don't understand what the numbers actually mean. Um, one of the things that all Western nations are actually facing over the next 20, 30 years is a real, uh, real loss of human capital. There's going to, there's with declining birth rates, and you can see that in Japan right now, where they're actually they're facing that now. Um, we have to bring in more people because we're not having we're not having as many children. The problem with this is, and I'll tell you, I, I call Canada a bit of a Ponzi scheme because uh, we have all these really great retirement benefits and workplace benefits and all of these different things that are there. And it's paid through a tax base and it's paid through workers that are supporting like retirees and whatnot. So how that works is, and just to give you some ideas about the numbers, in the 70s, there was six workers to every one retiree. Uh, currently it's, uh, it's three to one and by 2035, it'll be two to one, which is actually not sustainable. So if somebody is, uh, younger, our prime age that we're looking for is between 20 to 29 and upwards of 35, it's still possible. And I, and I, and I know that you deal with a lot of people that own businesses and whatnot. You can actually, if, uh, doing that, and I think we'll talk about that later is how to leverage your business to be able to come here. You can be older and be able to come here through say a business or some sort of economic program if you have that. But if you want to come directly and you're younger, all you need to do is show that you have a solid post-secondary education between 20 to 29. You've got at least one year of skilled work experience and you can speak English or French. That would set you up very nicely to be able to come here and just actually literally fill out an application and apply and come to Canada. So Are there that's how you can get it. Are there a lot of other countries like Canada that make it easy like that to be able to get in? Uh, there's a few, yeah. Um, and, and again, you you talked about your friend that was going uh, through to Italy. Um, it's a little bit more difficult uh, if you're going like to Europe and whatnot, unless you have lineage there. Uh, and there's a lot of people that do. Uh, I, I hear a lot about that. It's funny. One of one of the uh, people in my neighborhood where my office is, she's she's Greek, and she was going through. That's why I was smiling when you were saying that. She was going through a similar situation where her name was changed on the document and they were trying to prove all that. So that's a bit of a bit of a nightmare to do that. But there's there's a few countries, um, for instance, uh, Mexico, you can actually go and have a child there and then get permanent residency, kind of the birtherism thing that we hear about sometimes. Uh, but you can actually do that in Mexico if you want. Um, so you can go have a child there and then actually uh, file for permanent residency and eventually Mexican citizenship. There's a lot of these different rules. Um, a lot of the Central American and South American countries, a little bit harder in a lot of the Asian countries to be able to do that. Um, European countries, it varies. Uh, but yeah, North America is pretty easy. And, you know, again, we're looking at Canada. I think when you look at that and you're looking strategically at a passport, there's a number of different variables that you need to look at. Um, and Canada certainly checks a lot of the boxes. So what's the benefit? What, like, why do I benefit from, I know we talked about why Canada, for example, benefits by having us there. Mm -hmm. um, not us. I'm too old for Canada. Canada doesn't even like me before. It might be because I'm 45. But if I was younger, they'd like me. Just no, to, they'll take you. We'll take, oh, take you. <laughs> we'll take you. You're in. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, so let's say that, but, but why, why do I want to go there? Like, what's the yeah. benefit of me getting citizenship in another country? 
So there's a few different benefits and, and I'll just, uh, I'll tailor this answer more to your American audience. Um, so, geez, okay, so let's get started here. Let me list a few off. So first thing is, is I get a lot of calls from people uh, and they, they've heard something about healthcare, right? So healthcare is a big one because we have free healthcare and I'm just gonna dispel a lot of what you hear. They say, yeah, it's free, but it's kind of crap actually not true. Um, you know, it does take a little bit longer, but if you need to get in there for priority, you will get seen. Uh, there was just a survey that was done and, and Toronto General rated like the number fourth hospital in the world behind like, you know, the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland, like, you know, the hospitals that, you know. Uh, so there's that. There's the retirement benefits. But again, I look at it also like worker mobility. Um, a lot of people are looking at things like some of the trade agreements that are there. So you hear about these trade agreements all the time, but if you actually look into the trade agreements, there's worker provisions in there. So you can actually seamlessly move around. You talked about Europe as an example. So Europe, for instance, um, you can actually transfer yourself in through something called the Comprehensive European Trade Agreement, where Canada has that agreement with Europe. So there's Again, worker mobility to be able to move seamlessly throughout the world, I think, is a big one. Um, yeah, healthcare, worker benefits, uh, worker mobility. Um, one thing that's been popping up a lot, uh, and I, I didn't hear about this about until about three years ago, is the environment. Um, and originally when I heard it, I remember this lady, uh, she was from China, and she said to me, she was deciding between Australia and Canada. And she said, uh, I, you know, I kind of want to go to Canada and, and, you know, this is where I want to go. I said, and I said to her, I said, why is that? She's like, you know, primarily, I think you guys are going to have a lot of water. And I was like, hmm, interesting. I go, that's very future thinking. And I actually, I hear that a lot now. And now you're seeing like water shortages in different places. And people are actually starting to talk about this. I didn't even cross my mind, but she was like looking ahead like 75 years, you know, and she's like, yeah, I think you guys are going to have water. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of true. Okay. Interesting. Didn't think about it. So we hear a lot about the environment now crop up and I was, I was like, okay. Um, so yeah, those are some of the, those are some of the big points. Now you mentioned using a business here in the United States, which we're all mm -hmm. interested in because we're all entrepreneurs on this podcast. Uh, how can that be used? How, how can we have a business here in the States and use that to be able to get citizenship in, in Canada? Awesome question. Um, okay. So there's a number of different ways, but I'll, I'll just explore uh, one of the main ways with you and more from a, from an American context. So we've all heard about NAFTA and now it's like USMCA or Kuzma or whatever we call it now. Um, there's worker mobility provisions in there. So on a very basic general level, you can actually... Uh, take your business, open up a branch in Canada, transfer yourself in as an employee, open up the business and run a branch office here. And then you can use that to leverage to be able to get another passport. There's also significant other business uh, advantages to that as well. Um, obviously, uh, you know, you access to, you get access to a lot of the different uh, government services and trade services. Um, you know, you can play both sides of the border in terms of that. And again, I don't want to get into that. That's a whole different conversation, but that's in a nutshell. That's one of the things that you could do is basically open up a business here, transfer yourself in, and then actually use that to leverage and, and go through a program such as Canadian experience class or the federal skilled worker program, which are economic based application programs, which I was referring to the advantage there. And you, you were talking about uh, being older, um, you know, is that you actually get to leverage your business uh, capital uh, in terms of your experience and whatnot. And depending on how you craft the application, you'll get extra points where you're losing out maybe on the age points. You'll get those based on, you know, having Canadian work experience or having a senior executive level, which you've transferred yourself in at to be able to, to get that. The best thing about that is, is maybe not for somebody who's a little older, but maybe for somebody who is, uh, who's looking to the future. And this is something else that we hear a lot is that people are looking for their kids uh, or their grandkids, because that actually, that citizenship can be handed down. We don't know what the world's going to look like in 50 or 75 years. Um, but again, I, I like to think of it as having options for the future. 
uh, and being able to leverage that because really the reality is, is that the, the world is a smaller place. And I think that the advantages in the next generation are people that are going to have the ability to move freely throughout the world uh, and be able to uh, go for those opportunities where they are. So you're basically breaking down borders in that respect. You really see that as a future? I do. I do. Because I, you know, again, and, and the reason I see that is, is because I lived outside of the country for 15 years. Uh, and I did that for 15 years of my life where I traveled around and, and was able to do that and move seamlessly through different borders. Um, you know, I, I, you know, had different investor visas in different places and stuff. And yeah, it's, it's, there's a whole, it's a whole different, it's a whole different world in that respect. And um, I think that uh, I, yeah, I think that the world's gonna go to that. I think that borders are gonna kind of melt away. I think we're already seeing that. I, I, I appreciate that. One of my uh, bucket list items is to get knighted. And apparently getting knighted is not easy. You have to be a citizen over there. So this opens it up. Like I didn't even have a strategy to get it done until you showed up here today. Always perfect. Been. Perfect. That's awesome. Then I'd have to call you, sir. That's that's the whole point. It's just yeah. so everybody they would have to refer to me as Sir Crane. I just think that would be awesome to be knighted. Yeah. Yeah, but that's the first awesome. barrier is you have to be a citizen. So it's actually really good that we're having this discussion for that reason. Yeah, you should go check out the Hut River Colony. Go type that into Google and see about that because you could actually go and buy like a duke or a baronship. Uh, I'll tell you that story some other day, but go check that out. Oh, I, I'm doing that. Hut, Hut River Colony. Yeah, in Australia. All right, I, 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 I'm, I've got that on my list here. Uh, so you, you traveled a bunch overseas. Do you, you feel mm -hmm. that experience has helped you with what you do with helping people kind of transverse borders? Like 100, 100%, 100%. Um, it allows me to really identify with people. And I, I'll tell you that experience, I didn't know it at the time. I originally like got done. I finished university. I was 10 days out of school and I literally turned down uh, different jobs and I went to go teach English in Korea. And I was going to go for a year, come back, finish off law school, do all of that. And I literally was like, yeah, I'm not coming back. This is amazing. The experience that I gained over there, and I would say most uh, you know, most notably cross-culturally uh, has been invaluable to me. And especially with my business, like, you know, when I decided to come back to Canada, it was the same reason that I came back here as a lot of my clients will come here. And the reason is, is that they're looking for a safe, secure home for their kids. I actually got married overseas and, and my daughter was born overseas, my first daughter. And uh, really what happened was, is, uh, you know, it all changes at that point. And I was like, yeah, I think I got to go back to Canada and do that. But the thing with me was, is the world is a really interesting place and I needed to have a grounding for the kids and everything. But now I've got the best of both worlds because I actually get to bring the world to me, uh, which I really love. So it's just something that is just amazing for me. So yeah, definitely get to identify with my clients and uh, have a different perspective and understand where they're coming from when they want to come here. What's the process like to be able to get, to get citizenship in a place like Canada? Um, generally, uh, you'd be going through an economic pathway. And what that means is, is that uh, you'd be filling out an application, you generally would have to do an English test, show your educational credential checks, and then basically go through a very bureaucratic immigration process. At that point, what happens is, is that you would be confirmed as a permanent resident, you would arrive in Canada, and then you have to be in Canada two out of five years, okay? And then if you want your passport, you'd have to be here for three years to be able to get that. So there's some, there's a lot of caveats to all of that on how you, how you carve all of that up. It doesn't like, if you're looking at the U S for example, you have to be there and make entry every six months is, is generally the rule, or you'd get this thing called the travel pass. We don't have that. You can literally get your permanent residency, go away for like three years and then come back and complete your residency requirements in two years, or you can do it in different blocks, come up every summer, buy a cottage up here, spend some time in, in on a lake and like, yep, yeah, there's my residency. Uh, so I, I have clients that are doing that as well. Um, you know, I know that you're down in the South there, you know, you got a lot of Canadians coming down there too. And we have a lot of Americans coming up in the summer. So um, yeah, so you could do that. What, what about running a business in Canada tax benefit wise compared to like here in the United States? Okay. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to shift away from the tax side of things because I'm not very good with taxes, right? I have a really good accountant, but I'm just going to give you a kind of a blanket with this in terms of an American audience. So 
my advice is, is get a really good accountant because the cross border tax issues are complex, but they're actually, if you get the proper advice, they can be very, very, very beneficial. The US and Canada have tax treaties in place where you're not going to be double taxed. And if you're smart and you're running things through different Con, uh, companies, you can actually have those have the expenses on you know carved up any way which way you want it, and you can actually have that minimize your tax burden. You're not going to be double taxed. You're going to pay the difference of of what the assessment is owing. Um, and again, I I have a lot of clients that will spend some time with a tax professional. As part of Second Passport, we have tax professionals that we uh, that we work with, and I will have them. Uh, you know, they'll craft up their their plans and and uh, basically have all of that in place. It can be very, very, very beneficial. I don't know well, if that answers your question. Yeah, to the, yeah absolutely. I hope so. Yeah. yeah, as much as a non-tax guy can help. Exactly. I I'm you know I, <laughs> yeah, you don't want tax advice from me. <laughs> I got a I got a great accountant though, Michael. And man, this guy, uh, yeah, you know. Anybody who's running a business knows, you know, don't skimp on your accountant or your lawyer, right? So have it all sorted. But if we yeah. tax help, call Michael, the accountant. That's it. Call Michael. <laughs> you got it. What about settlement planning? Is that how, like what, what's involved with settlement planning in, in a transition like this? So um, normally what I do is uh, I tell people, and this is where the holistic approach to immigration comes in. A lot of people, they, they, they come, they put together their plan, they file their, fill their stuff out. And then they're like, okay, now I'm here. What do I do? So if somebody's coming and they're opening a business, that's a different settlement plan. So it's basically what settlement planning is, is what are you going to do when you get here? So the biggest thing is, is, you know, are you going to bring your job? I've got a, I've got a ton of Americans right now that are working remotely and they're like, I can do that anywhere I want. The Canadian dollar is lower right now. So I can actually come bring my dollar, bring my American dollar up here, get an extra buck 20 or up upwards of a buck 30 on that still live the same lifestyle that I'm leading pretty much in the States, Canada and the U S are pretty much synonymous. You know, you guys have, different chocolate bars than we have. I always find you go in, it's like you mix everything together in combinations I would have never even thought of. Um, but uh, no, it's pretty seamless. You've got Netflix, you got everything you want, right? So what else, what else do you need? But uh, no, a lot of people are doing that. They're transporting their jobs. They're staying up here. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it really depends on the individual. So for instance, if somebody's coming uh, and they, they're looking for a particular lifestyle, like some people will go and they'll have their job and they'll literally be like, yeah, I just want to ski in like, you know, some of the best skiing that I can find in the Rocky Mountains. So I'm going to go live in a, in a mountain town. Uh, you know, I'll give an example. There's a place called Kimberly in BC. Man, they're they're next to some world class skiing, and there's an airport where you can hop air uh, airlines and be like in the states in like, you know, uh, a couple hours, pretty much anywhere on the Western Seaboard, or you can drive down to Spokane and be there in an hour and a half, and still you're living this like really great lifestyle, and you're getting extra money on your uh, uh, on your dollar, right? What do you, what do you do as else do you do as an immigration consultant? Because this is all great advice. I mean, do you just yeah. help people immigrate to Canada, or do you do help people do this all over the world? Uh, no, I just do Canada. I just do Canada. I help people come to Canada, but I help people from all over the world. Um, and one of the one of the things that's different about Second Passport is is that, you know, you know, we were talking about the world changing and becoming a smaller place. And one of the biggest things is is that, you know. Um, I think the way that we're doing things, like I look at legal services, a lot of the traditional legal services were basically like, hi, I'm really smart, pay me money and I'll do your work. So that was that's one of the services that I've offered, but I've expanded that uh, over the last couple of years because this is what I wanted to do because there's a good chunk of people that can actually go and do this themselves, but they just got to know where the, the traps are, as I call it, like the pit of snakes, if you've seen Indiana Jones, right? dating myself, I know, but they, they fall into those traps, right? And so they have to know where that is. So what we've done is basically said, listen, you can go through, figure out if you qualify, figure out the type of life that you want to lead, and then, uh, and then go and get that. And, and having that, that citizenship, I, I believe, is, a, is really a big asset. So again, getting back to the world changing, I think that um, 
you know, what we do is, is we've taken a very holistic approach and, and incorporated settlement. And I think that we're probably the only people that are doing that because I actually got to see, I was helping a lot of people settle in here and I got to see that, you know, people that weren't planning ahead and coming here, it, it, it wasn't really pretty for some people. So it all boils down to anything in life that you have to have a plan and then you have to be able to execute on the plan. So that's what Second Passport is. And that's what the immigration success system is all about. What, what, tell me about your book. Yeah. So the book is, uh, goes through and it talks about the system. So, um, I go through the different steps that I have. There's three stages, which is basically, you know, planning and then implementation, right. And then settlement. So, uh, what we do is, is in the first stage, the culmination of that is, is to put together something we call the immigration blueprint. Um, we run those, uh, quite regularly. And it's it's not onerous on people at all. They can actually come in, do it either live for five days. And then at the end of it, they actually know what their pathway is to come to Canada. Uh, or they know that, hey, man, maybe this isn't for me. Um, so that's, that's generally the plan. And then once you have the plan, you have to be able to execute on it. So we do things like the application build, we go through and then we talk about the tactical submission and, and, uh, the landing experience. Um, this is all, uh, this is all part of the process in terms of being able to put everything together. And this is what the book talks about. Then we talk about, uh, on the settlement side, we talk about landing. We talk about all the things that you can do prior to coming here. And then once you, once you come here so that you actually set it up. And then finally, it covers citizenship and all the benefits that that has and, and just lays it all out. So I basically what I've done is I've tried to lay it all out into a workable format for people to be able to, you know, see the process and go through it and understand exactly uh, what they need to do at, at different stages. Where can everybody go that's watching to learn more? So normally what I've done is I've just given out my email. Um, I know it sounds, I don't have like, you know, oh, go here, put in your information and I'll email you. But people can just go to uh, email me directly at brandon at mysecondpassport.ca. Um, you know, and uh, they can just, yeah, just, hey, Brandon, how are you? It comes to me too. I don't have like, you know, mindless outsourced uh, assistants somewhere that are sitting in some far off land. So I, if, you know, quite frankly, if somebody just wants to email me and say, hey, I'm really interested, I heard you on this podcast, then sure, uh, I'll send you a copy of my book um, and you can check that out. And if you want to join us, then by all means, we'd love to have you. But I think that's that's great. So just send me an email, brandon at mysecondpassport.ca. Awesome. Brandon, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. I loved it. So listen, if you're watching this today, you know, in, this is obviously a little off topic of what we usually cover. But I thought it was a very interesting topic because with COVID, a lot of things are changing. A lot of people are now moving probably. I mean, we'll see the statistics soon. And greater numbers than I've ever seen from state to state and even country to country. And if you're entertaining these type of things, like I have a lot of friends right now that are entertaining moving to other countries. But the thing is, you don't have to move. You, there's a good chance you can get a second passport. You can get dual citizenship in a lot of different places. And I thought this was a very timely topic for Brandon to dive in and talk about some of the things to think about and how actually easy and accessible this is. And as business owners or having somebody that, that has a desire to open a business, potentially even in another country, there's even more flexibility with what we're able to do because these countries want us. Like when we own businesses, we hire people, we bring more people in. And as Brandon pointed out, that's what they're really looking for um, everybody, because the more citizens you have, the more taxes you can charge, you know, the more money they can they make, and the more growth any kind of state or country um, can actually experience. So if you want to learn more, make sure you visit mysecondpassport.ca. That's mysecondpassport.ca. Brandon, how do they get your book? Just send me an email to brandon at mysecondpassport.ca and I'll send you uh, I'll send you a copy if they say that they heard about uh, heard about you here heard about oh. me here um, or they can go to Amazon and pick it up but uh, if they want an e-copy great if you want a hard copy then it's on Amazon. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to put the link to Amazon to Brandon's book right here in the show resources page for this podcast. And if you if you email Brandon at mysecondpassport.ca, then he'll even send you the electronic version for free, yeah. no cost. So you have different options there. So make sure you go to Amazon, grab his book. 
I'm the one that likes to have a physical book in my hands. I don't know why it just makes me feel better. Plus I like the, to read them, sit on a hammock somewhere. And right. read them. So make sure you go to Amazon support Brandon, get his book. You can also get in touch with him at Brandon at my second passport.ca to get a free electronic copy of the book. And make sure you check out his website too, my second passport.ca. There's just a lot of great information on Brandon's site, including a blog that has answers to a lot of questions. I never even would have thought of, right? So like, if you're going through this experience, if you're thinking about it, you're going to have a lot of things. That it's what you don't know that can get you. His blog and a lot of the information on his website gets into a lot of those things we wouldn't think about and even answers a lot of those questions to give you a smoother path to success. So make sure you visit mysecondpassport.ca. Make sure you visit the Amazon link to grab the second passport book from Brandon as well. And also feel free to email Brandon direct to set up a time to talk more and to get a free electronic version of his book. And that's brandon at mysecondpassport.ca. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.